human sacrifice. We've talked about it before, and we'll probably talk about it again. Can this be called worshiping the gods? Can we be said to have an honorable idea of them if we suppose that they are pleased with slaughter, thirst for human blood, and are capable of requiring or accepting such offers? In this day and age, can such thoughts and practices truly be justified? In Carthage, they can. And it's surprising considering that in all other aspects, Carthage is a model republic of the modern age. But their devotion to Saturn is absolute, and it includes human sacrifice. In most cases, children of noble families are selected for sacrifice in the flames. But in their recent defeat to Syracuse, the Carthaginian army was far from home. Their general's son, Hamilcar, offered up sacrifices of living men throughout the battle, thrown in great numbers on a flaming pile. And when he saw his troops defeated, he jumped in himself. Because of this, one of the conditions of peace ordered by Galen of Syracuse is that human sacrifice stops. But this isn't the first time Carthage has had that ban imposed, and whether or not it remains enforced, only time will tell. And we thought it would never end. The longest year ever recorded, 445 days, has just come to a close thanks to Julius Caesar and his astronomer Sisygenes of Alexandria. But why so long? Well, what's being attempted here is the creation of a calendar year that will remain consistently aligned with the seasons and the sun. And to do that, it's been determined that several things have to change. First, the length of our normal year has to change from 355 to 365 days. Second, Every four years, an extra day has to be added to one of the months. And finally, 90 days had to be added to the last year to get the seasons and dates in the right place. A bit confusing, perhaps, but it's all behind us now, and with any luck, we may actually see the leaves falling in October every year, instead of Ianarius or Martius. With negotiations coming to an end, it appears that the Empire's decades-long civil wars are over for good, as all sides have agreed to the terms of the Treaty of Verdun. Turns out that the Battle of Fortenay was the final blow to King Lothair's claim over his brothers Louis the German and Charles the Bald, and the realm of the Franks that was established by Charlemagne's grandfather over a hundred years ago is now secured. Here's a map of the kingdoms as they're going to look from now on. And as you can see, it's a logical division that should assure peace and stability for a long time to come. Louis is to receive the kingdom of East Francia. Charles gets West Francia. And Lothar will rule Middle Francia, along with the cities of Aachen and Rome. I'm glad that's over. It turns out Pope Leo X has a lot more to be worried about than the Turks to the east and the recent intrigues to the north. He apparently needs to be covering his rear. And an extraordinary plot to poison him has been revealed, and that plot was hatched at the sacred college itself. According to reliable confessions, chief among the conspirators is the young Cardinal Alfonso Petrucci, who has been strangled himself in what authorities are calling an unrelated incident. Four other cardinals have been arrested as co-conspirators, among them Cardinal Riario, grandnephew of the late Pope Sixtus IV. As for the Pope's rear, the plot is said to have involved injecting poison into his buttock on the pretext of lancing a boil. Thank goodness for second opinions. And in social circles, new man about town, Albert Einstein, has become a fixture at several of Prague's intellectual hotspots as of late. A recent addition to the faculty at the German Institute of Physics, he's been seen mingling with the likes of Hugo Bergman and Max Brod at Café Slavia and Café Louvre, as well as hobnobbing with Franz Kafka at Café Arco. And every Tuesday, they gather at the preeminent intellectual circle of the city. Located at the Salon of Berta Fanta in Wenceslas Square, the group includes physicist Philip Frank, philosophers Christian von Ehrenfeld and Felix Welch, Gerald Koleski, Rudolf Steiner, and Franz Bertano. As can be imagined, topics of conversation can be deep and heated, from the strained German-Czech relations to obsessions with chaos in the universe. 
but on this past Tuesday, Einstein seemed to be putting some order in it as he tried to explain his new ideas about light bending through gravity. A few beers later, the conversation had lightened up and Professor Einstein had traded his notes for his violin. An instrument I hear he plays surprisingly well. And that is today's look at history's headlines.